All right. Very good morning to all of you. Um, it's my pleasure to be the moderator uh, for this segment, Strengthening the Regulatory Development or Landscape of Sustainable Finance in Asia Pacific. My name is Junis Yeo. I'm the Executive Director at uh, Sustainability Media and Intelligence Agency, EcoBusiness. Um, it is my pleasure to be here setting the context to what's going to be uh, really game-changing the nature uh, and developments of sustainable finance today. And before I begin to introduce my panelists and start off the panel, uh, allow me to just share a few anecdotes and experience uh, from my time uh, in the sustainable development space, uh, especially working with businesses, with um, institutions, uh, and of course with the financial sector as well uh, in the last uh, decade or so. And I'd like to perhaps uh, give a small uh, hello as well to my uh, esteemed counterpart, Esther Ann, whom you already had the pleasure of listening to her. She's just walking in right now. Uh, and share a little bit of a journey that I had with Esther when I also started out uh, as a sustainability specialist. When um, in 2016, actually, I met with Esther Ann, and who came to me with a very difficult task. And her challenge was that she was obviously doing a lot in reporting and sustainability. She earlier said that she has been already on the 16th edition of the sustainability report. That's amazing, of course. But the question was, who is reading the report and why does it matter? And her role, Esther's challenge really, was how can you convince the CFO of the company that the investors actually care about this information. I think that was a challenge that she came, gave to me as a consultant to help her. And we tried really to um, delve into some of the, you know, I, I would say strengths of the company, but also understand how the financial markets think about sustainable, uh, sustainable development and why does it matter to them. Then fast forward two years later, the Singapore Stock Exchange um, came back with a survey and they found that over 90% of investors institutional investors are, in fact, looking for ESG information, 90%. That's a big number, of course. And that actually goes to show that there is interest, but is there supply of ESG information? So, of course, you know, since then, 2017 onwards, we saw a lot of traction because the stock exchanges understood what the investors wanted, and then there you had much more financial institutions taking hold of that information and knowing that if we disclose more, if we encourage non-financial companies to disclose more, investors will be more uh, encouraged as well. And since then, of course, you know, we've got a lot of traction uh, you know, from the financial space and non-financial space really actively supplying you know, meaningful data, meaningful information around sustainability. And of course, today's discussion that we're having is around how can we help more regulators around the region, more policy makers make sense of this information, this financial and non-financial information and make that meaningful. One key aspect of this is climate risk. And climate risk comes in two forms, as many of you know, physical risks and transition risks. And when we talk about transition risk, that's of course related to policy risks, legal risks, technology risk and market risk. Now, I have distinguished panelists here who are going to be the foundation building the structure uh, on how we can mitigate transition risks uh, for the future. When I engage with different types of sectors, one of the key sectors in our region is insurance, right? And insurance, uh, of course, you know, cares about climate risk greatly because they would be insuring uh, many sectors as well. But reinsurance is an interesting one as well. And in reinsurance in Europe, for example, um, the private sector play, plays a very key role in this. The private sector plays a key role because they realize, of course, that there is um, market opportunities there. But the reinsurance companies tell me uh, that in Asia Pacific, they need the government, they need the public sector money to fund reinsurance projects and climate risk projects simply because the risks in Asia Pacific are far too high. We need the participation of public sector and private sector. And so with this, in my mind, of course, that's, that's a, a very key you know, message to me that without public sector participation and without public sector funding, securing um, capital flows, incentivizing capital flows in this region, it's going to be difficult for us to achieve any of our sustainable outcomes. And so with this, I, I'm very pleased to be welcoming uh, my panelists here 
all um, sitting across the room, you know, and, and really from very different parts of Asia Pacific. I'm pleased to be the, perhaps the moderator for the largest panel for the next two days, but also one that uh, is very diverse um, and coming from different walks of the financial sector as well. So, um, and we're going to be talking, of course, about the current state of affairs, but also how would the future of sus sustainable finance look like from a regulatory and policy lens. And so if you allow me to just take a few more minutes uh, to introduce my panelists. First up, excuse me, oops. <laughs> First up, I would like to introduce my panelist one, uh, Shigeru Aritsumi. He is the Vice Commissioner for International Affairs of the Japanese Financial Services Agency. He also is the Vice Chair for the IAIS, or the International Association for Insurance Supervisors Executive Committee, as well as the Vice Chair for IOSCO uh, on the board itself. So Mr. Shigeru Aritsumi uh, obviously holds very key positions in the Japanese uh, Financial Services Agency, but he also worked as Director in charge of supervising Japanese large banks and investment banks, as well as foreign financial institutions across Japan. My second panelist is Mr. Pyong Seok Seo, Director of Financial Stability Department at the Bank of Korea. Um, prior to his current position, he worked for the Financial Markets Department, International Department, and International Affairs Department at the Central Bank uh, here in Korea as well. Very pleased to be welcoming you. And my third is Gitu Joshi. Ms. Gitu Joshi is presently advisor in the Ministry of Finance in the Government of India. She played a pivotal role in formulating and implementing policies on trade and commerce, the power sector, education, as well as other areas that are of economic interests in India. Um, um, in her current role, uh, what's notable is Ms. Joshi also heads the Sustainable Finance Working Group Vertical of the G20 Finance Track. She's also dealing with policy matters pertaining to uh, the South Asian Association for Regional uh, Cooperation, ASEAN, as well as member states of the Commonwealth of Independent States, uh, among others in the Department of Economic Affairs. Welcome to you too. All right, my fourth panelist is Lynn Javier. Uh, Ms. Lynn Javier is the Assistant Governor of the Banco Central ng Pilipinas, uh, uh, Pilipinas excuse me, in the Philippines. Uh, she oversees the supervisory policy and data departments of the BSP, or the Central Bank in the Philippines, as well as the supervision of specialized areas, including money laundering, info technology, treasury, and trust operations. Uh, Ms. Javier is also the designated BSP representative in the Basel Consultative Group, the executives' meetings of the East Asia Pacific Central Bank's working group on banking supervision, as well as on one of the work streams for the NGFS. And last but not least, over there on my right is Dr. Achala Abe Singha. She is the director and head of programs for Asia at the Global Green Growth um, Institute. Uh, and the Global Green Growth Institute, of course, is responsible in driving really this um, Asia's transition towards a model of economic growth. Uh, that is environmentally sustainable and as well as socially inclusive. Uh, Dr. Abe Singha is an international climate change and sustainable development expert with over 20 years of global and national experience. Uh, in 2015, what's notable is that as the legal, technical and strategic advisor to the least developed uh, countries group of the, I, of the UNFCCC. She played a key role in negotiating the Paris Agreement on Climate Change and was recognized as one of the female climate champions in the world. So as you can see, I have a very, very illustrious panel here with fantastic track record, and I'm not going to hold us back from um, the discussions now. So allow me to first um, maybe perhaps take a, a, a stab at, you know, really discussing the role and regulation in support of the development or sustainable development goals. And first up, maybe perhaps congratulations to Japan and India for your tremendous work really in, uh, on, on G G7 as well as G20. If I may ask the first question really to uh, Shigeru and Gitu, perhaps if you could just you know, uh, give us perhaps some top line key themes of sustainable finance that you're seeing come up in the G7 and G20 uh, discussions. These are obviously very important multilateral fora uh, you know, where we would see market signals taking place. Can you give us a flavor of the discussions in terms of priorities as well as opportunities? Okay, so uh, let me start off. Uh, thank you. First, let me thank the uh, UN 
UNEP uh, F5 for hosting this event and uh, having giving me a chance to speak here. Uh, as you may know, the G7 uh, finance ministers, central bank governors met in Niigata from the 11th to the 13th of May, and we just concluded a G7 summit in Hiroshima, as has been reported. We had the pleasure and the honor to receive uh, the Honorable President uh, Jung from Korea, as well as the Honorable uh, Prime Minister uh, Bodhi from uh, India as well, uh, and, and it was a very productive uh, meeting. Let me uh, share with you some of the key takeaways on transition on, on, on sustainable finance. Um, and uh, the first, as uh, Judas mentioned, is, is about a sustainable uh, sustainability disclosure. Of course, ensuring uh, appropriate disclosure of sustainability-related information is one of the key drivers to ensure that uh, informed uh, investment decisions will be made. And it enables corporates to engage in constructive discussions with the investors about opportunities, risks, and strategies related to sustainability issues, including uh, climate change. And given the global nature of climate change as highlighted by previous speakers, here the comparability, consistency, and reliability of sustainability related information will be essential. Uh, as, uh, as I think um, the previous speaker from the ISS, the board member of ISSB mentioned about the global baseline uh, on what the ISSB is currently working on. We had, uh, had a very uh, productive discussion with Emmanuel Faber who, who, who heads the ISSB on this front. And it's also very important to make sure uh, the interoperability of the standard will be, uh, will be achieved. And this is very important in the context of the discussion of ISSB and FRAG, of course, uh, to ensure that the ISSB uh, operates as a global race line, but also uh, pr provide for interoperability with uh, regional in initiatives, including in Europe. So I think that's a very important point moving forward. The uh, this G7 finance ministers and central bank governors expressed support for the ISSB to finalize the standards, which we, we uh, assume will be done by next month. And also the, uh, uh, the G7 expressed uh, support or looked forward to the discussions of IOSCO uh, for potential endorsement of the two standards because it's very important from here after the finalization of the ISSB standards on how to implement it moving into 2024. We expect uh, the ISSB to uh, discuss about adoption guidance uh, on the way to ensure that uh, the standards could be uh, properly uh, implemented. And we also think that uh, the endorsement uh, the discussion on the endorsement of potential, uh, potential endorsement by OSCO would also be quite relevant in terms of ensuring an effective implementation going forward. The second point I want to make is about the importance of mobilization of capital to support transition to net zero. And I'm sure uh, G2 would have a lot of things to say about uh, how to support developing economies in order to make uh, such kind of a transition. And achieving the goals of the Paris Agreement requires an economy as a whole uh, transition and unprecedented mobilization of capital, including from the private sector, to support such transition. And as you may know, Japan has been a strong advocate for transition finance in, the, in international discussions and subsequently the G20 Sustainable Finance Working Group developed a high-level framework on transition finance. And what is the challenge from here is how to operationalize transition finance. What does, what, what does exactly transition finance mean? And I think uh, here, uh, I, I think there's going to be a lot of discussion as well as um, examples uh, that, that could uh, highlight or demonstrate what transition finance will be. And this is a very important uh, point because we believe that 
this is not just about, uh, this is about a economy as a whole transition involving all sectors. So all sectors should try to move towards net zero. And that's, that's what transition finance is. But of course, this is based on a credible pathway towards uh, achieving net zero. So we need to kind of operationalize, provide examples, look into more uh, use cases here. And that will be a, a challenge, and that, but that will be very important moving on from here. The final point I mentioned like, uh, is, is on, uh, as Junius mentioned, the importance of insurance. And we have actually highlighted that, that in the context of natural uh, disaster, uh, disaster risk finance, because we think that uh, the severity and the frequency of natural disaster has been increasing not only in advanced economies, but also in developing economies as, a whole, as well. So it's a, it's a global issue. It's not just about a certain region. Of course, it manifests, it, it kind of manifests its way in a different style. So in certain jurisdictions, earthquake would be a problem. Certain jurisdictions, a flood. Certain jurisdictions, it could be drought. But uh, all in all, I think um, the result of the current uh, climate change has kind of uh, symbolizes the importance of dealing with natural disaster. Uh, for example, Swiss Re has said that um, uh, natural disasters, the economic losses resulting from natural disasters, including like typhoons and floods, are estimated around 270 billion in 2022. So we need to look at this uh, perspective very carefully. The G7 finance ministers and central bank governors agreed that enhanced co coordination by the private sector and the public sector is critical in promoting disaster risk finance, including insurance, in order to narrow protection gaps. And they also look forward to a report by the IAIS in collaboration with the OECD on how to strengthen economic and financial resilience against natural disasters. And this report is expected to be delivered by the end of this year. So let me stop here uh, to p just to uh, pass it on to perhaps Jitu. Um, thank you. Um, good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you, Junis, and uh, thank you to UNEP. F5 to give me an opportunity to speak about India's G20 presidency. So before I come to the specifics of uh, the priorities taken up in the sustainable finance area, I would like to briefly touch upon the ideology behind agenda setting for India's G20 presidency. So here I'd just like to mention about the theme of India's G20 presidency, which is Vasudeva Kutumbakam. Uh, that is one earth, one family, one future. This reflects the spirit of interconnectedness of the planet. And there is, the theme also supports lifestyle for environment, which is taken up as a cross-cutting issue across all working groups. So uh, this, of course, tells us that while setting the agenda, India has placed sustainability at the core of the development agenda for G20. And we have adopted a pro-planet and a people-centric approach while arriving at the priorities and uh, recommendations in respect of those priorities. Uh, having given this background, I'll just move to the areas, specific areas which we have taken up under the Sustainable Finance Working Group uh, during our presidency. So the f there are three areas which we are focusing on during this um, year. The first is mobilizing timely and adequate finance for climate action, both uh, adaptation and mitigation. The second area is enabling finance for the sustainable development goals. And the third area is capacity building of the entire ecosystem, the entire sustainable finance ecosystem. Um, just to give a snapshot of uh, what is in each of these priorities. Uh, so the discussions in the first priority have centered around how to mobilize or catalyze private finance towards climate action. And in that, how public resources or um, uh, government funds and other 
multilateral development funds can be leveraged to get uh, more private capital flows into climate action. So this could be by way of uh, de-risking projects or uh, by way of uh, enhanced uh, uh, capital flows. So uh, going um, further, of course, in this agenda, it is uh, we are also discussing the role that multilateral development banks have to play in leveraging private capital and uh, that this role needs to be strengthened. Uh, there is also need to develop a range of innovative financial mechanisms to develop and deploy uh, green and low carbon technologies. Uh, we are also having discussions on the no non-price policy measures which are important in complementing the price mechanisms in uh, transition to low carbon development. Um, of course, uh, the second agenda is about sustainable development goals and uh, this is the first time in during the Indian presidency that we have gone beyond climate to discuss other sustainable development goals and how to finance these sustainable development goals in the coming years. So in this agenda or in this priority, there are two issues which we have taken up for discussion this year. The first is about uh, improving the data and reporting on nature and biodiversity. And the second is about improving or scaling up of social impact investment. So how can we have uh, instruments and uh, which instruments can be scaled up to have uh, more social impact investment. And uh, of course, this is um, very important in the wake of the COVID pandemic, which has widened the financing gap to um, almost 3.9 US dollar trillion um, for developing countries on an annual basis. So uh, there, are going, there are going to be recommendations coming up on enabling finance for sustainable development goals. And thirdly, we've taken up capacity building, which is uh, very important for implementing all the recommendations which are um, coming up during discussions at the G20 meetings. Uh, we all know that the lack of adequate knowledge and uh, skilled professionals is an important deterrent for scaling up sustainable finance. So uh, many of us here are aware of uh, uh, how important it is for technical assistance to be there, especially in an emerging area like sustainable finance. And so in this presidency, we aim to develop a technical assistance action plan, which will have recommendations for governments, for international organizations, for financial institutions on how to scale up capacity building by we have identified um, the skilling gaps and uh, so uh, a stock take analysis was done where we've identified skilling gaps and the requirements in the sustainable finance landscape and uh, we will develop a technical assistance action plan to implement uh, all the capacity building efforts uh, across the globe. Um, I also would like to add before I conclude that yes, there are synergies and discussions between G7 and G20 and we are working in close collaboration. And some of the issues which were mentioned by Shigur Shigeru in his opening remarks also are figuring in the sustainable finance landscape in G20. With that, I'll close. Wonderful. Thank you, Thank you for the updates. Uh, that was very conclusive and, and also comprehensive. All right, now we're going to move to the role of the central banks. And I'm going to turn to my left. I've got two representatives, one from Korea and one from the Philippines. Um, and if you could ask, you know, um, Pyong Seok yourself and also Lin, you know, beyond managing material climate risks, you know, and that obviously is a key part of regulations, what do you think would be the role of, of your regulatory, I would say, uh, institution in enabling and incentivizing the broader alignment of the real economy and, and also the sustainable development goals? Um, thank you for inviting me to this uh, distinguished panel. It is my great 
honor to be part of these important discussions. I will talk about the government's roles in achieving these uh, sustainability development goals. So sustainable development goals, such as greenhouse gas reductions, is a typical example of uh, public goods and exposed to a uh, market failure. So government's role should focus on um, complementing market failure and facilitating market um, mechanism. So market mechanism is essential, not only because um, it promotes the you know, private sector's creativity, but also because um, we need uh, private market funds to, um, to secure the necessary uh, funding for the you know, green uh, project. So international communities' efforts emphasize the facilitating the you know, market mechanisms. These include uh, you know, carbon markets and uh, green finance. In the Asian Pacific regions, uh, several countries, including Korea, China, and Japan, and Kazakhstan, New Zealand, opened the you know, carbon markets. And uh, according to the IMF, the um, um, private fund invested in, in green project in Asia, it has reached to 100, $160 billion in year 2020, but it is far short of uh, you know, $1 trillion, $1 trillion dollar investment estimated to needed for the uh, respond to a climate uh, risk in the region. So we need to bolster the uh, momentum for uh, pr promoting sustainable uh, finance in the region. So to this end, government need to reinforce infrastructure and uh, incentives through a policy mix of regulation and the fiscal support. So first, we need to strengthen the infra in, uh, information infrastructures, especially on climate risk. Uh, trusted information is the basis for the public enhancing the public understanding, also for uh, in obtaining public consent through a, a democratic process that is essential for the government to implement regulations and fiscal support. In particular, we need to uh, provide information not only on risk, but also on you know, economic opportunities that can be realized by pursuing these uh, sustainable goals. By doing so, we can facilitate you know, voluntary participation of the private sector. In this regard, Bank of Korea, as one of the you know, uh, macroeconomic policy institutions in charge of the monitor policy, is strengthening its uh, effort to provide climate-related re risk information. So we recently established the um, Sustainable Development Research Team to uh, enhance our research capabilities. Also uh, set up a new committee uh, internal committee where uh, banks management discuss sustainable agenda. So uh, when it comes to uh, you know, market infrastructure, governments need to induce appropriate level of you know, carbon price that can incentivize the private sector to reduce carbon re reduction, carbon emission, and to meet you know, carbon neutrality uh, goals. And so Korea raised its NDC goals, raised its NDC goal and announced in a national carbon neutral basic plans uh, April this year. And um, we also introduced uh, in a Korean taxonomy and uh, um, mandatory ESG uh, disclosure for the listed companies and are preparing ESG uh, evaluation guidance. On the other hand, we also need to support small and medium-sized enterprises which are lacking the ability to respond to a climate risk uh, properly. While green finance, while green finance is currently in a center on large corporations, the SMEs, which account for the majority of the Asian economies, 
still have very limited access to a green finance. That's due to if uh, that that's mainly due to insufficient capacity to uh, measure and report their climate risk. To alleviate the burden of the SMEs, government government needs to support SMEs in building their infrastructures of measuring and reporting their um, uh, climate-related risk data. So by doing so, they can improve their access to uh, uh, green finance. And recently, uh, newly emerging of, of uh, green finance products that incorporates the uh, new technologies, such as the blockchains, may provide a cost-efficient way to uh, to report and uh, measure the uh, these uh, uh, greenhouse uh, the, the uh, climate-related informations, and it is expected to uh, improve the uh, accessibility of the green finance by the SMEs. And lastly, uh, we cannot emphasize too much the importance of the uh, leadership of these uh, international organizations. Interne international organizations um, you know, serve as the, uh, the vital plat platform for knowledge sharing and enable the uh, countries to um, adopt you know, efficient strategies that suit their own economic environments. Moreover, uh, even when the country faces uh, challenges um, in pursuing their develop, uh, sustainable development goals uh, due to uh, economic or political fluctuations, the international organizations will play a pivotal role in ensuring uh, each, uh, these countries sustain their commitment to uh, uh, sustainability goals. I will stop there. Thank you. That was very useful. And I, I think to extend on market leadership on key initiatives, uh, perhaps I can contextualize that into the um, uh, the BS, the excuse me, the PRBs as well, the principles for responsible banking. And I wonder specifically for, for, for the Philippines, you know, what role do you see um, you know, the PRB and other market leadership initiatives play to advance policy and, and, uh, and regulatory agenda in your country? Yeah. Um, thank you, Eunice. Uh, good morning, everyone. And thank you to the UNEP-FI for inviting the Banco Central the Filipinas to be part of this discussion. Actually, the Banco Central sees a whole of society approach in terms of promoting the sustainability agenda. So the regulator is just one of the many actors in terms of promoting sustainable finance. So market leadership, they actually complement uh, regulations issued by the Banco Central. The PRB principles, uh, the, the general principles are aligned also with the principles espoused by the sustainable finance framework issued by the Banco Central. First on corporate governance, second on risk management, accountability to consumers. So um, on corporate governance, we have emphasized also the tone from the top. So, so this means we are fostering uh, board to make responsible decisions concerning environment and society. Effective risk management, as you effectively manage risk, you'll be able to provide more and you're enabled to um, continue to deliver financial services to households and businesses, including the vulnerable sector. And of course, consumer protection, also upholding transparency and um, the, the, the rights of um, consumers. So um, now signing or subscribing to um, initiatives of um, um, the industry, as well as say the, the PRB, it, it, it reflects a strong commitment of the financial institution to actually change and shape their behaviors and their future decisions and actions aligned with the sustainability agenda. Now this facilitates adoption, makes our work, uh, our work easier because it facilitates adoption of also the regulations, the Banco Central issue and promotes the public trust. Now uh, industry also supports in terms of capacity building and uh, building awareness among the different stakeholders within the financial industry, also their clients. So uh, again, this promotes partnership and collaboration between and among different stakeholders in adopting sustainability principles. Thank you. That was very useful. And, and I, I definitely agree with you um, uh, that changing and influencing behavior really comes, uh, you know, from all sides and in all directions. Okay, um, I, I'd like to turn to the climate change expert here, um, Achala. 
you've, you've, you know, you've obviously, you know, interacted with many different organizations uh, in your two decades of working. And, you know, beyond managing material, uh, excuse me, uh, I, I guess the question is beyond managing uh, these, these, uh, these risks, in a, in a sense. How do regulators in the region manage to balance taking into account regional specificities when ensuring that regulatory approaches, you know, are aligned with international best practice? Thank you, Janice. Uh, hello, everyone. Almost good afternoon. Um, thank you to UNEP FI for the invitation. It's a privilege to be here. Um, just before I uh, go to answer your question, Janice, I want to say that uh, GGGI, um, as a way of approaching to address the question, um, I am bringing in examples from uh, some of our work in our uh, 45 uh, member countries that GGGI has. GGGI is an intergovernmental organization, and we are, as you mentioned, working uh, with our member countries to support their transition to a green, inclusive, and resilient economic model. And we are privileged to be led by His Excellency Ban Ki-moon, who is the former uh, UN Secretary General. So just um, before I go to uh, the international and regional standards, I also want to focus a little bit on uh, the overall real economy sustainability model that we need to focus on, particularly when it comes to this financial discussion. Otherwise, it is, there is a risk of us working in, in uh, very much in silos. In our work with our member countries, what we see is there is a huge uh, mismatch or misalignment with, uh, in the policy and regulatory landscape. Uh, for example, um, in um, some countries, we have updated the taxonomies, which is a financial regulation, a range of newly devised subsidies for clean energy products, which is a fiscal policy, but the Energy Act is set in the 1990s or uh, previous decades where, where the fossil fuel-based power plants were the norm. So we need to really change this uh, landscape, regulatory and policy land landscape, to really align to the needs of what we are discussing today. Um, and then in terms of the just transition, I think uh, the, the regulatory uh, aspect and aligning with uh, regional specificities and international standards, there is a need to bring in that just transition aspect. This discussion that we are having is not just a technical discussion. It is not just a financial discussion. There is a huge uh, human element to it. So bringing in standards that actually, and the regulations that actually address the human needs, the need for reskilling, the need for upskilling or lateral skilling of uh, the uh, people who are engaged in, uh, for example, in the coal uh, power sector today is extremely important. And um, helping these people to really uh, address their social uh, status is important. And then for the just transition, uh, the role of women, I can't emphasize enough the need for the standards, ne the need for uh, the discussion to also think about how we address the uh, the need and need to bring in women into an inclusive gr growth discussion. Um, in terms of the um, um, standards, um, taking the need to take the regional as well as local specificities into this discussion and align them with the international standards, I think the local and regional specificities are extremely important. Uh, the, irrespective of the need to consolidate standards at uh, international level. The, um, a thorough business as usual scenario analysis to identify the gaps and barriers in terms of uh, what the uh, problems that the regulations are targeting. Uh, to solve, I think is a must because this is important uh, because that can become the basis of data collection and further analysis to prepare and propose local and regional focus solutions. And then the second one is the robust uh, stakeholder consultations, particularly when it comes to the standard settings and aligning standards into international level is important because uh, a stakeholder consultations can give us an idea or ideas for capacity strengthening that is necessary uh, to align with uh, the international or uh, the regional standards. 
Um, currently, we are seeing increasing uh, consolidation in the green standard space. Uh, the International Sustainability Standards Board being one of the examples. Um, and, uh, but the problem uh, for me uh, when we work with our countries is mainly around how to comply with standards. Standard setting is happening, but in terms of compliance, uh, there is a huge capacity gap that we need to address. Um, and the, the capacity gap is also not across the sector. There are uh, large corporations with um, um, bigger capacity and resources to hire consultants, lawyers, accountants that are necessary uh, in terms of uh, complying with the international or regional standards. But there are also the SMEs um, uh, or sole proprietors that will struggle in uh, complying with standards and therefore I think we really need to focus on that aspect as well in supporting um, our countries and, and the businesses. And GGGI is heavily focusing on actually supporting SMEs and sole proprietors in this uh, regard. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very, very comprehensive. And I agree with you, you know, there's a, a multi-stakeholder agenda in this whole uh, business of getting everybody on board. So, and it's not easy for sure. Okay, I'm going to very quickly switch gears a little bit and, and talk about the role of banking supervision uh, and also climate stress testing because that's a very key component today uh, in, in, you know, I guess our agenda in sustainable finance. And perhaps if I could just, you know, turn the floor to the Bank of Korea, uh, Pyong Seok. What lessons does the Bank of Korea have um, learned from the recent you know, climate stress test, and, and how is this going to help inform future policy and regulation? Uh, thank you, Junis. Um, Bank of Korea's climate test showed that the, uh, Korea could face um, significant uh, transition risk moving to a carbon neutral economy. That's mainly because um, our, our you know, economic structures, you know, manufacturing industries dominate our uh, Korean economy uh, structure. So, however, when it comes to a generation um, production, uh, uh, power generation industries, uh, where decarbonization uh, technologies such as you know renewable renewable energy were commercialized, the negative impact of the uh, transition risk is significantly reduced. So, we can mitigate the. Um, these uh, negative impact of the uh, transition risk in manufacturing sectors by developing, you know, and mobilizing the technology to develop the uh, decarbonization um, technologies. And also another benefit that we expect from this uh, stress test is that the, uh, by sharing the, the, the methodologies and the experience and uh, test uh, results of the stress test, um, we could contribute to enhancing the capabilities of the private companies and financial institutions to analyze and quantify the you know, climate-related risk. And by doing so, private sector could respond to a climate a risk more efficiently and more effectively and facilitating uh, the develop, uh, development of the green finance further. However, current uh, current st stress test is has been limited to a transition risk, so we are now working on on uh, developing physical risk uh, stress test. So especially we are trying to uh, factor in the uh, the fiscal risk risk in Korean Peninsula, as well as the uh, fiscal risk of um, uh, fiscal risk uh, from. Uh, the cross-border impact of the fiscal risk from in you know, foreign countries. So, uh, with completing this uh, comprehensive you know, stress test, um, we hope that the, uh, we could contribute to uh, c enhancing climate response uh, capabilities of Korean companies and financial institutions. Um, I will stop there. Thank you. And uh, what about for BSP, uh, Lin? You, I mean, you, you, are, you are obviously sitting on, on um, you know, the working group for NGFS as well. And, and I'm sure for, the, for BSP, the, the climate stress test, uh, excuse me, climate risk stress test is a key component of, of what you're designing. Can you share some perspectives of, of the role of this global guidance? Yeah, uh, thank you again, Eunice. Actually, the first stress test conducted on the Philippines was, was under the Financial Sector Assessment Program mission. We were one of the 
first countries where uh, that uh, exercise was conducted. Uh, based on that results, it would have uh, the impact of um, the physical risk would be systemic as far as our GDP is concerned, but um, largely um, within manageable levels as far as the banking capital is concerned, owing also to the reforms implemented in the past. Right now, we're working with a development partner in conducting stress testing exercises for transition risk, basically aimed at estimating the potential impact on sectoral macroeconomic and the, the banking sector as well of um, transition scenarios and decarbonization policies. Now, well, w when you look at stress testing exercises per se and the global guidance, you, you, you basically have also the challenges in mind when you do this. We have limitations on resource, expertise, tools, methodologies, and data limitations as well. So when you look at the NGFS scenario, these scenarios actually serve as our guideposts in terms of adopting scenarios that are suited to our jurisdiction. And it provides us with some leeway to tweak it to make them suited to domestic conditions. Now, again, global guidance does not uh, begin and end with uh, stress testing scenarios. We also benefit from discussions, global conversations, and the adoption of sustainable finance and risk management practices. Through these global conversations, we were as simple as um, setting timelines for the stress testing exercises. We used to set ambitious timelines, but now they're ambitious but realistic timelines considering the challenges that we're facing as well. And it also shaped our approach in terms of adopting the sustainability agenda. What's important is that in this conversation, you share practices, you share your challenges, and you share also some approaches that we might also adopt as an emerging country. So um, what's highlighted is that collaboration is key in terms of pursuing and promoting sustainable finance. Thanks, Judy. Good points. Yep, practicality is everything. I, I do agree. Okay, um, on my right, <laughs> I, I want to ask a question around taxonomies and, and you know, uh, as a tool, uh, you know, for sustainable finance, it is an important mechanism for many. Of course, you know, taxonomies define what's green and what isn't. And, and you know, for many uh, financial institutions, it really helps to be a prerequisite for financial and non-financial uh, corporates to advance their own sustainability agenda. And I guess for, for this question really is for Japan and India and specifically maybe perhaps Shigeru first. Uh, could you share some updates on Japan's take on the sustainable uh, taxonomy at the moment? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Junis. Uh, I'd like to emphasize the importance of being inclusive, being interactive and being innovative. So those are, I think, the three most important points. On taxonomy, and you may know that Japan does not uh, take on this taxonomy approach. We, we think that uh, while we recognize the virtue of it, we think it's um, the economy as a whole transition should uh, be inclusive and to make sure that all sectors move towards net zero. And because it's not a very short journey, it's not a snapshot, it's a more or less continuing, it, it, it will evolve uh, in the future, for example, how, how the GHG will uh, the, the trajectory of the GHG can evolve. We also think that uh, given the continuous relationship of financial institutions with their clients uh, requires them to engage in a continuous manner. So, so our approach is uh, for the government to perhaps uh, uh, lay out a roadmap which the financial uh, institutions and the corporates can build on to uh, identify their critical pathways, their respective critical pathways. And I think that may, uh, you know, kind of uh, coincide with what's happening in Philippines, for example, in terms of sectoral pathways and so forth. But uh, our approach is that uh, we, we take that approach. We also think that being interactive is very important because there could be, uh, there could be gaps between the perception gap between the financial institutions and their clients. And we need to narrow down that gap uh, through, uh, uh, through engagement. And I think that's very important in terms of uh, also for the financial institutions because their emission is your emission in a sense uh, in terms of financed emission. And also it's very important that the client sees the opportunity and contain the risks. And that is very important in terms of uh, the business of the financial institutions. So being interactive is, 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 is extremely important. The last point being in innovative, I think this is important in terms of public and private partnership on trying to move towards uh, net zero. There are various ways, various tools, various uh, methods that uh, public and private can cooperate. And let me also highlight the, the importance of innovation. 
this is not exactly in the mandate of JFSA, but as a government, for example, Japan has uh, announced a plan to mobilize uh, in 10 years 150 trillion yen, which is about 1.2 trillion uh, US dollars. So I think that uh, pushing innovation is also critical. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so India, of course, as um, I, I, most of us would know, we don't have a taxonomy as of now. But um, uh, as Shigoro mentioned, this is an evolving area. And uh, world over, we've seen that uh, there are different uh, economies adopting taxonomies to align sustainability uh, investments to the sustainability goals. So uh, having said that, of course, India is committed to climate action and has taken, undertaken several policy and regulatory measures uh, in its transition uh, to a green economy, which also include uh, the financial market regulator, uh, SEBI, which has come out with the business responsibility and sustainability reporting standards, which are uh, mandatory for the top thousand listed companies. So uh, recognizing the need to um, have well-defined classification of activities is uh, there and financial institutions need to recognize that this is an important way to align investments to the sustainability development goals. And uh, also uh, before, meaning I think uh, we are running short of time, so I'll just mention a quick comment on uh, the need to have an effective transition finance framework. That is very important uh, to enable an economy-wide transition to a green economy. So uh, this uh, transition framework, uh, we have uh, a set of principles which was developed in the last year uh, during G20 presidency of Indonesia. And uh, this transition finance framework will definitely uh, help uh, financial institutions, companies, and uh, the private sector to align their investments to um, um, sustainable goals. Thank so you. is this what we should expect uh, in the coming years from India? Okay, very interesting. All right, I'm going to ask the last question because I understand we might be running out of time. Um, Achala, listening to what you know, our participants here, our panelists had to share about you know, their adoption of various uh, mechanisms really to drive the sustainable finance agenda. In your view, what tools and regulatory <coughs> excuse me, approaches do you find to be most conducive uh, in supporting the finance industry? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So taxonomies, I think we've um, talked about taxonomies, but uh, beyond taxonomies, there are things that I think we could do in terms of uh, uh, supporting uh, the financial institutions. One example I want to bring in is that we uh, work with the Papua New Guinea Central Bank, we worked uh, to develop their green taxonomy through an inclusive green finance policy. So the Central Bank led the development of the uh, inclusive green finance policy and the taxonomy that was within it. And it was a, an opt-in uh, tool for the financial institutions to come in and, uh, and um, uh, you know, follow that uh, structure. But beyond that, what we are now uh, working uh, is uh, to develop, establish a dedicated green finance center so to take that taxonomy and the inclusive finance policy beyond where it is right now to knowledge dissemination and also training. And also we are setting up refinancing facilities and also loan guarantee schemes. I think these are important to really take the taxonomies and the policies beyond uh, uh, the uh, just mere adoption. And we are now also working uh, to, with a number of countries like Sri Lanka and a number of other countries to develop sustainable finance frameworks, which brings the whole uh, the regulatory approach under one umbrella to develop uh, the uh, sustainability linked bonds, green bonds, and social bonds, etc., to help uh, the financial institutions to really take the taxonomy uh, to the next level. And in that, what is extremely important is having a robust pipeline of bankable projects. 
and also having a, a system to do uh, selection, do monitoring, do verification, and as well as reporting on those, uh, those uh, uh, projects that we develop. And so this one, uh, we are working with a number of countries under a trust fund that we are managing through support from the Luxembourg government. We are also managing the Korea Green New Deal Trust Fund, which is also contributing to, uh, to this work. Um, I also want to mention finally that overall policy landscape of a country that, is n that may not necessarily be finance related, something like the long-term low emission development strategies that most of the countries are developing now under the Paris Agreement, these can also set pathways for the financial institutions to come in in terms of the transition that is necessary. And therefore, the government beyond the finance-related regulators, our overall government and the policy setting has a extremely crucial role to play there. Thank you so much. Fantastic, and thank you very much. That was a very good summary as well of, of what I think we are going to expect from our counterparts across the region. Uh, with that, I wish uh, um, all my panelists very good luck in your uh, pursuits in sustainable finance uh, across the various strategies that you have. And please join me to thank my, my speakers here uh, for their fantastic contributions. Thank you.